And if you send her an email, she's probably going to bring it up. Say, yeah, Lori emailed me, David, and she said that you're a (laughs) douchebag on Tuesdays. (laughs) You're listening to the Nacho Kids Podcast, where we discuss all things step family related. Real stories, real people, real help. Your hosts are the creators of the Nacho Kids Method and the Nacho Kids Academy Step Family Coaching Team, Lori and David Sims. Welcome to episode 202 of the Nacho Kids Podcast. Deuce, alt deuce. <laughs> David, why didn't we, um, I'm just curious, this has nothing to do with anything, but you know, some people do uh, season one, episode blah, blah, blah. Why didn't we do ours that way? Because we don't want to. Okay. I was just wondering. Because <laughs> a lot of times when they do that, there's, there's a break between them. Oh, so by doing that, you allowed us to not have a break. That was your choice. That was my choice? Yeah. I gave oh. you the, I gave you all these options, and you were like, I'll just do one every week. Oh, that's probably what I said. I mean, you know, think about it. Let's say you have a, let's say, three-month break between seasons. Imagine a, yeah. all those blended families out there that can't get help for three months. <laughs> Like there's nobody else out there that can help them? There's nobody else out there. David. Doing nacho. (laughs) Well, nobody else out there should be doing nacho. We'll phrase (laughs) it that way. (laughs) And if you are, let me know so I can send you a cease and desist. And you can ignore it. (laughs) All right. So what all we got going on is spring. It ain't spring. It's still cold in the mornings. But it's spring. Spring's already sprung. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I found this cute little bunny, little artsy looking bunny. It's the outline of a bunny mm-hmm. without the outline. Follow me. <laughs> but it's got. <laughs> yeah, I follow you. Yeah, it's got little flowers, different color flowers and different size flowers to create the bunny image. And it's mm. so pretty. Okay. I sent, the, sent that out in my newsletter. Okay. For, so the, I guess, for the Academy members. Oh, so the only way to get the newsletter is to be in the Academy. No, you just get a better one. <laughs> so how would you sign up for the newsletter? Get to the website? Well, David, it's really simple. To sign up for our newsletter, you go to nachokids.com, scroll all the way to the bottom. Why do you make it sound like Because it's long? It felt like a long. <laughs> you need a faster scroll thing. Maybe I do, because it's like 10 scrolls. Because you got the podcast episodes showing on there, and then blah, 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 and testimonials, all that stuff. Anyway, scroll to the very bottom. Put your name and your email and sign up, and we will keep you abreast of things going on in Nacho Land. Nacho Land. (laughs) That's where I feel like I am sometimes. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) I tell you. Yeah, so let's talk about dinner yesterday, lunch specifically. Okay, what about it? So we decide we're going to have Easter lunch, and and we don't invite a bunch of people over. We just invite my son, one of my son, my oldest son. <laughs> um, and then, you know, I'm thinking maybe Jackson's girlfriend is going to show up, but she doesn't, which not unusual. She's probably got family stuff going on. Jackson was there. Yeah, Jackson was there. He actually had dinner, or excuse me, lunch. He actually had lunch with us sitting at the table. How many of you have kids that grab food and run <laughs> to another room? Yours did that. He ate and left. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But uh, but we're sitting there, and we're we're eating lunch. It's, you know, nice, nice Easter dinner, lunch. And Lori says... <laughs> Um, I hope y'all enjoyed Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> okay, first of all, that's not what was said exactly. Okay, what was exactly okay. said? I asked Jax, was it good? And he said, yeah. I said, well, happy Thanksgiving. Yes, that's what you said. And <laughs> and and y'all, I looked at her and I said, it's Easter. And she's like, oh. <gasps> that's not what happened either. <laughs> We're going to have to set up video cameras. Because okay, what, what happened then? I don't even know that you said it was Easter. I think somebody said Thanksgiving. 
And I started laughing, and I said, I knew it wasn't Thanksgiving in my head. But it came out Thanksgiving and not Easter. But you didn't tell me it was Easter. Like, duh, I knew that. Are you sure? I'm sure. I don't know that you are. You didn't even know what day it was. I'm positive. And and then Avery's like, well, I guess I don't have to come over for Thanksgiving. No, you told him that. See? See? You don't even know who said what. See, you mess all this up. No, then, you then, said that to Avery. And then yesterday, Avery's leaving. He's like, tell Lori, happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> See, I can say that because you weren't out there to contradict me. Well, I'm just telling you, your memories are wrong. <sighs> Sorry. It's the same spirit of the conversation. No, because you had different people saying things that didn't say those things. <laughs> You don't know who said anything. You're just saying, I don't know who said Easter, <laughs> but I knew that, dude. I said Easter. <laughs> I mean, uh, see, you do that. Whatever. I said Thanksgiving, and then somebody <laughs> said Thanksgiving. I was like, uh, Easter. Who do you mean somebody? I said Thanksgiving. You said you said Easter. But if you said I didn't say Easter, then I must have said Thanksgiving because I was the only one who said anything. David, you are so driving up, me back. So make crap up your mind. Crazy. And you wonder why I've been watching House Hunters International lately. Make up your mind. The truth has come out. Did I say Easter or did I say Thanksgiving? You said neither. Now you're just gaslighting. No. I did say. It was Avery. No. Yes. No. All right, folks, so if your memory's not good and you don't know who said what, join the Academy. (laughs) They're like, we don't want to join your Academy. Y'all don't even know who you are. Well, we will be coming up with a course on how to improve your memory. (laughs) We If we we can remember to do one. (laughs) Yes. That's like, remember those pills that we got to help your memory? I can't remember to take them. I know. (laughs) I was like, are you taking them? You're like, I can't remember to take them. I'm like, me either. I know. There should be like a pre-memory pill. Yeah. Something like like that. Take this pill to help you remember to take your pill. Well, but here's the other thing. (laughs) (laughs) Um, The older we get, the more interesting all this is because... You you've say that, stuff you've sometimes. You've been that way forever. Don't say that. Well, it then, got to do with age. Well, then it's got to do with your age. You just get to the point where you're actually able to blame it on something. <laughs> no, because you'll say stuff, and I'm like, I thought he was a smart man. <laughs> what are you talking about? You don't listen to me. How do you sometimes know what I'm Sometimes you say stuff, and I'm like, how old are you? <laughs> like what? Give me an example. <laughs> no, I can't. Give me an example. I can't because you'll use it against me. You always do this. <laughs> no, we're not talking I, about it anymore. No, I got to hear it. Nope, I'm done. Come I'm on. done. Come All on. right, so no, put it out there for the world, Shh, David. People Come don't on. like to hear these intros. I'm trying to speed it up. <laughs> no, everybody wants David, to know. Inquiring David. minds want to know. Nobody wants to know. Everybody okay. wants to know. Well, then they can email me if at Lori at notchukids.com. No, if you can't give me an example, it didn't happen. You're just trying to make up stuff. <laughs> I'm trying to you're, save f- save your face. No, you're stalling and so trying to come up with something is what <laughs> no, you're doing. No, no, no. I, I got tagging. something in my head. Oh, I already gosh. got it. I already got it. It's there. All right. Well, okay. after this recording, you're going to tell me. You can't make me. Okay, folks. First of all, if you are tired of arguing with your spouse... <laughs> 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 and want to improve your blended relationships, we can help you. Yeah, we'll Don't argue be for you. Yes, right. we'll argue for you. <laughs> <laughs> Go to nachokidsacademy.com where you will see that it is not being mean to your stepkids. You will see that it is not dumping everything on your partner and saying, hey, my kids, screw you. None of that. That ain't what it is. <laughs> I could probably came up with something better, couldn't I? This is fantastic. (laughs) You just keep going. I'm sure tomorrow you won't remember you said it anyway. David. (laughs) Lord Jesus. It's a far. Yeah. Okay. So our guest today is Anna de Acosta. (gasps) Uh, Anna. Anna. It's Anna. Anna's in the house. Anna's in the house. 
Yes, Anna and I talk about therapy mm. and the need for it. Yeah, you do need it. She told me that she really thought I did need it because I'm married to you. <laughs> She's not wrong. She's not wrong. She said, mm. aside from the button pushing, there's other issues. I said, I know, <laughs> Anna. <laughs> Did you tell her you talk about her all the time? No, do I? Yeah. You'll be sitting there talking, and you'll go, Anna, 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 Anna. <laughs> <laughs> that is not true. <laughs> like, there you go, out. making up that crap again. <laughs> it's like the story you tell everybody about how we met. That's a lie. It is not a lie. You it started is... telling that lie immediately. <laughs> it is a... Um, it is a... Bigger, bolder version of the truth. <laughs> okay. So, Anna and I talk about how you need to find the right therapist. Just because you go to a therapist doesn't mean you're going to like them. And I'm not saying that you need to like everybody for them to be able to help you. In fact, you probably need some people that you don't like to be able to help you. But you need to feel comfortable <laughs> enough to talk to them. Yeah. You know what I'm saying, David? Quit acting like you're making my life difficult here. I, I'm not. I'm I'm just taking it all in. I'm just trying to figure out where you're trying to go with this. I'm trying to go with if you go to a therapist <laughs> and you have and you a should meeting, like them or not like them no. or sometimes like them or sometimes not like them. Well, you don't want to just be with somebody that agrees with everything you say. You're okay. not going to learn that way. I agree with that. Okay. So that was one thing of what I said. The other thing is, is if you go to a therapist and you leave and you're like, something just doesn't jive with that person for whatever reason, mm -hmm. you don't have to go back to them, but find somebody else. Okay. It's important to vet these therapists. And when I say vet them, let your first 20 minutes of your meeting with them be you asking them questions. Mm, I agree with that. Of... Do you have experience with blended families? Do you have experience with stepkids and bio kids having inappropriate behavior mm. with each other? Do you have experience with addiction in the blended family? So you need to know this stuff. And not that everybody needs to be an expert, but one of the questions you should ask them is if they are of the belief that blended families are just nuclear families. Mm. If they say yes, say thank you, have a good day, and please look into the Nacho Kids method. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, have had people vet their therapist and ask them if they knew about the Nacho method. Yeah. And surprisingly, the majority of therapists do. Yeah. And the ones that don't, they're like, oh, I'll check it out. Yeah. And that's the answer you want to hear. Yeah. You could also ask them, do you side with David or Lori? <laughs> if they side with David, run, Forrest, <laughs> run. That means they got more common sense. No, that means they're a button pusher. That's what that means. <laughs> but it is important to spend the time to look for a therapist. And I joke in here, and I've said it before, we spend more time researching air fryers before we buy them than we do looking into therapists. Yeah. Shoes. Anything. You and I you and I are bad about that. Which paper towel should we get? I don't know. Let's look at the reviews. Let's see. <laughs> Let's convert these measurements and make sure we're not getting one inch less on this one. I'm if kidding. it's two ply, we can peel them in half. <laughs> <laughs> so it is very important that you talk to a therapist. And again, you can talk to a therapist, a counselor, a coach. We do coaching. We know several step family people that do coaching. We know some therapists. We we know everybody. Everybody. Mm -hmm. Well, it you know, therapy is getting to the point where it doesn't have quite the stigma. I still think maybe it does have some still. I think it's just the generation, the younger generation. Mm -hmm. Like I think the thirty mid thirties right now. Uh huh. They're all for it. Yeah. Yeah. But I still think there's the stigma with some people in our generation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you're right. But I'm glad it's getting to the point where people are looking at it going, okay, just because you're going to therapy doesn't mean something is broken or wrong. 
I think people should be in therapy uh, just just for general improvement and talking with somebody and working through coping skills and any other life problems. And when you don't have any problems at all, it's good to go and just to make sure that you are prepared for when things do come your way because <laughs> it's going to come at some point. Right. Well, and again, when we say therapy, we mean a counselor, coaching, all that whole realm of stuff. Yeah, yeah, all, all the stuff, not not just a licensed therapist, in, any of it. Mm-hmm. One other thing Anna and I talk about is you cannot force someone else to go to therapy. Mm-mm, you sure can't. So I share a story <laughs> of how my mama made me go to a shrink. Oh, really? Oh, I heard this one. <laughs> and I ain't going to tell you. You got to listen to the podcast. Oh, what? Oh, so you talked about it in an interview. Uh-huh. Oh, interesting. Si, si senor. I definitely want to hear this one because I tried to get you to go to a shrink for your craziness. To make me lose weight is what you tried to get me to go to a shrink for. What to you shrink about? my waistline. <laughs> 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 I'm kidding. He's still breathing. <laughs> but she was unable to get her husband to go to therapy. He's not interested. He does a lot of self-care things, but that's not one of them. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sure if I went to therapy, I'd probably end up having a therapist on the couch and me trying to help them out. Because you're so perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Insert eye roll. <laughs> so there's this thing called... <laughs> I've talked about this way, way back. Bioenergetic intolerance elimination. Mm -hmm. One of David's friends does it. It's um, some kind of hoodoo vibration energy. <laughs> it's not hoodoo. Acupuncture thing combined. It's pretty cool. Um, anyway, so you go and you test these things to see if your system is weak to certain things. Pollen, for example, wheat, all that. Well, David went. Guess what? Nothing. Nothing. Well, they didn't have you there. Well, then when I go back, I hear about your husband's perfect. <laughs> perfect, David. David ain't got no weaknesses. You my weakness, darling. Yeah. Good answer, David. <laughs> See, if they had to put you in the vial, I wouldn't have been able to do it. But y'all check that stuff out. It's really interesting because um, I had never heard of it until David's friend got into it. And he got into it because his daughter was suffering some trauma and he heard about it. He went to Canada. It worked. It helped her. So he's like, I got to get trained on this so I can help other people. Kind of like we decided we had to do with the Nacho Kids. We had to share it with other people to help them. Mm -hmm. So check out BIE. If anybody's ever done it, let me know your experience. I enjoyed it. Did you? Well, I like being able to tell him if I had a weakness to it before he could tell me. Because I could feel it. I could feel a difference in the vials on my skin. Hmm. Yeah. Maybe we should have a nacho version of that. <laughs> Put bio mom in a vial. <laughs> 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 oh Lord, don't get me started. You should okay, probably folks. do that. You should do that on, like on your first date. <laughs> take you, take go the date. to the BIE. <laughs> yeah, you're like I want to know what I'm getting into here. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> hey, I might. We got. I got to talk to Greg. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now we did talk about other things in this, but. This is kind of where this episode goes. So, David? Let's get to listening. Today, we have Anna de Acosta. Hey, Anna, how are you? Hi, Lori. So good to see you again. You too. I'm doing okay. You didn't butcher my name. Good. I have a bit of a cold, so you might hear my voice is a little bit different than usual, but I'm doing fine otherwise. Okay. So, you and I had a talk the other day, and... We decided that we wanted to do this podcast on what to do when your partner doesn't want to get help. Yes. 
I was talking about last night in my in my group that I run, my support group that I run for stepmoms and women who take care of others. I was mentioning that we were going to talk about this topic today and everyone was super excited and, and they're for sure going to listen. So they wanted to hear your take on it. So it's going to be a good conversation. Oh, awesome. I will say it's very frustrating when you want to get help and your partner's like, no, I'm not going to talk to anybody And it's like, you feel like you're on your own to fix this. Now, I don't know if the listeners have ever seen the movie Fireproof. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, I've seen that one. It's like a Christian movie, right? Yeah. David and I actually went and watched it. I think it came out before we got married because we went to the movies to actually see it. And in that movie, there is reference to the love dare. And it talks about how one person in the relationship can actually do things to improve the relationship without the other person getting help, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times the work we do on ourselves changes how our partner sees us or reacts to us. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I remember that movie. I saw it so long ago, but I remember getting my husband to watch it because I wanted him to be the one who steps up and does the thing. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And that never happened. Oh, no. (laughs) (laughs) But I think you and I have a different experience because if I recall, your whole Nacho Kids journey started when you were in therapy with David, right? So you guys went to therapy. My husband and I never did. (laughs) Well, the funny thing is, is we had went to therapy as a last ditch effort. Yeah. And that's when the counselor told me they're not your kids. We Mm -hmm. didn't go to but a handful of therapy sessions. One, the stepkids went. One, the in-laws went with us. But it was that time that he kept telling me, Lori, they're not your kids. That was the breaking moment to where I realized they're not my kids, even though I knew that. But that's what started the whole Nacho Kids thing. We had actually met with this counselor before we got married because I knew him, and we knew that the blend wouldn't be easy, and he gave us some tips, and when I called him when we were struggling, he said, I've been waiting to hear from you. (laughs) (laughs) That's funny. Because he knew. I I wonder if he says that to all his patients. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I know David David is open to therapy and Mm -hmm. things like that, but I think at that point, it was... Let's just go see what happens because something's got to change. And if nothing else, maybe Lori will get some help because Mm -hmm. I was the crazy one at the time. Yeah. Yeah. But so your husband, he's not big on going to therapy or? No, like I am. I've been in therapy for, I don't even remember the first time I went, but it's my go-to because I'm the type of person that likes to talk through my problems. Whereas he's very careful about, who he shares things with and he's very selective about that so he he doesn't believe in going to tell like another random person about your problems and that they're going to know better so it's been a struggle with me like just letting that go and accepting that that's not part of his journey Mm -hmm. especially because therapy is something that's so important to me therapy coaching but I am lucky in that he is a very spiritual person and so He does seek like spiritual counsel and is into self-improvement in that way. Mm -hmm. So that I think has been our saving grace. And I had to really learn to let go of the need to fix him or make him fix things Mm -hmm. and really focus on the way that I show up. Like what you were saying at the beginning, we have so much power in how we show up to a situation. And when we show up transformed, that's when we can influence people. Whereas if we're also doing wrong and trying to teach other people how to do it right or how to fix the situation when we're not doing anything to fix it, it's not going to get you very far, right? Right. Your greatest power is your power to change yourself and influence others through that self-transformation. That's what I believe. Yes. And you're trying to convince your husband otherwise. Is not going to be beneficial. The first years ago, the first thing I would have said is, well, does he not realize that 
having an outsider's viewpoint that's not emotionally attached can give him insight he doesn't see. Mm-hmm. But he he doesn't agree with it. He doesn't believe in it. He's it, but he doesn't bash you for going. But it's just not no. for him, and that's okay. Exactly. Yeah. And you continue to do work on yourself, which really does change the dynamics of your relationship in a better way. And it changes the feeling in the home. Yeah, exactly. And I think the the thing is, like, it's not just me doing work on myself. I do work on myself through therapy, through coaching. He still does work on himself. It's just not through therapy. Mm-hmm. And I think that's important because it's it's not fair that all the onus has to be on one person to change and make things better, especially when the problems are things that you didn't create and things that you really have no control over, like bio mom stuff, you know, like step kid behavior stuff when you're not a full-time step mom. And I see a lot of this in my clients where they're trying to do everything to make everything work. And all you can really focus on is making it work for you. You can't fix everything for everyone. Right. Like you can't fix what you didn't break, right? And mm-hmm. it's important to make that distinction that it's not one person showing up and fixing everything. You're just working on your part in it. And through that process, you may realize that you've outgrown the situation and the relationship is no longer what's right for you if if you're the only one who's changing and there are no external changes. But I've seen more often times than not that when you take radical responsibility for your part in the chaos that you're creating for yourself in your own mind, that's when things shift for you internally. And then other people shift in the way that they respond to you. Right. And there's so much power in that and things kind of fall into place. And people might even become curious about therapy if they see that it's affecting you in a positive way or not, not just therapy, but getting any kind of help through coaching, even through like reading blogs on other people's perspectives going through the same situation. Exactly. I know one thing that helped me tremendously was the Nacho Kids Method. Part of that is the self-transformation. And Mm -hmm. through that self-transformation is being able to see I'm not the only one struggling here. And it helped me to offer grace to the stepkids and to David, which when I was struggling so bad, I couldn't see what they were going through because I was so clouded with the issues I was going through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And it's, yeah, like I was talking to someone just the other day, a friend of mine actually, and she's a stepmom and she's dealing with like a teenage stepdaughter who's coming into her home and taking pictures and sending them to, to bio mom and their relationship isn't great. And and she's telling her partner, like, you should, um, like, tell your daughter something, but don't tell her I said it, you mm-hmm. know, because then she's going to hate me. But then her partner is like, well, you're putting me in the middle here. Like, what am I supposed to do? And and oftentimes we put our partner in the middle and they're in a, in a no-win situation, right? Right. And most of them, I'm going to say most, have guilty parent syndrome. And so yeah. they don't know what to do to make everybody happy. And it's like David said, he felt like he was stuck in the middle and no matter what he did, it was wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's so important to show empathy like for your partner in their situation too, because it's not all about you. It is. And then there's the whole piece of the kids too. Like I've seen some stepmoms who just have zero empathy for what the stepkids must be going through, going from one home to the next. And they place so much blame and negative emotion on the kids for what their mom does right but it's Mm -hmm. they're just innocent victims in the in in what's happening and unfortunately over time as they grow up the kids could turn into like perpetrators in that sense that they're now playing out those dynamics and and being insulting like they they learn what they learn from bio mom's house but it's important to remember like where it all came from and it's not their fault. Yes. Either. Yes. But it is easy to get sucked into that of focusing on the stepkids and looking at them as the problem. Mm-hmm. When they're kids, a lot of times we expect them 
to respond better to situations than we do as adults. Oh, yeah. I know I'm still guilty of that sometimes with my own kids. Yeah, exactly. Now, one thing I want to mention is you would be shocked to know the number of therapists and counselors that have joined the Nacho Kids Academy. Mm -hmm. But that just shows that even therapists believe in getting help. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times with therapists, they're like, I know I know what to do. I just, I need help. I need somebody to remind me of what to do and help me get back in that mindset of this is how I do it. Yeah. The reminders and, and the constant, the community of people who get you are so key, right? Yes. And luckily, therapy is not looked at like it was when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. When I was growing up, it was, oh my gosh, you're going to therapy. You're psycho. You're going to end up in a straight jacket. It's not like that anymore. People are realizing the importance of therapy for their mental health. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's just somebody to talk to and complain to because you don't want to complain to your husband. Mm -hmm. And just somebody that has a fresh perspective on things. And like I said, a non-emotional attachment to the situation. Yeah. So let's say that you want to go to therapy and your husband says, I'm not doing that. I'm not going to talk to some stranger about the problems you have, because a lot <laughs> of times they think you're the problem. Mm -hmm. Is it okay to get hurt? Have your feelings hurt about that? Absolutely. But you can't control them. And if you try to make them go, it is not going to be productive. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you a funny story. As a child, I was a very rebellious child. I know people find that shocking. <laughs> <laughs> and so my mom made me go to a psychologist or whatever one time. And again, I was a very bad child. The guy kept looking at his watch. And every time he would, I'd say, what time is it? Because I think it's rude for you to look at a watch while you're talking to me. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I'll play your little game. So I didn't want to go. So when he would ask me questions, I would ask him questions. Mm -hmm. I would never give him a straight answer. I did not try to get help. I was there because my mom made me go. And I was going to make it miserable for everybody. Mm -hmm. And really, I guess she wanted me to go so I'd quit being a smart aleck teenager. But that didn't happen. I just carried it over into that thing. Needless to say, the mm -hmm. guy told him that there was no need for me to be in therapy, that I was just an average teenager being rebellious. Mm -hmm. it, that was another way of saying, don't bring her back here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it's also so important. Like to find the right person to talk to, I think, because I've, I've had a lot of bad therapists in my, in my life journey mm -hmm. and it can almost make you seem like, feel like, like you're even more of a problem because you can't connect with someone, but it's not always you. Right. And it's important to take that time to find someone who you actually want to talk to and open up with and someone who you feel safe with. Right. And we say this all the time, people will look for a therapist, and the first thing they look to see is if covered under their insurance. Mm -hmm. Then they look for proximity, what's closest to me. Mm -hmm. And then they choose whether male or woman, whatever. We spend more time researching which air fryer to buy than we do which <laughs> therapist to go to. Mm -hmm. And then I've been to a couple of therapists, too, that I was required to go to court-ordered therapy with my ex because of his refusal to co-parent years mm -hmm. and years ago. And luckily, I went to one without him. He forgot to show up. I did not mm -hmm. like this woman at all. Mm -hmm. So I knew that she was not the right one. Yeah. And so thankfully, he didn't show up because if he would have, they probably would have gotten along and I'd have been stuck in that session. <laughs> So I found somebody else, and it's okay to not jive with somebody, you know, and mm -hmm. you're not looking for a friend when you go talk to these people. You're looking for somebody that you feel is listening to you, understands you, and wants to help you. Mm -hmm. 
So if you go to a therapist and you just don't get a good vibe off of it, for instance, we see people in the Nacho Kids Facebook group all the time. I went to a therapist and they told me I just needed to love the kids more. (laughs) Well, that's not what that person needed to hear. Like you said, that just Mm -hmm. made them feel worse. And Mm -hmm. it's okay to not make another appointment. Mm -hmm. But remember, there's a fine line between somebody validating what you're doing and someone trying to help you. You don't Mm -hmm. want somebody that's just going to validate everything you're doing. But you also want, especially with blended family stuff, you want somebody that has an understanding of blended families and they don't try to force that nuclear family expectation on the blend. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be great if you could like interview your therapist before you sign up? I think you should. And ask, you should be able to. And that's kind of like with coaching, with the coaching world, that's what a discovery call is for, Mm -hmm. right? It's to see if you're a good fit. And I think there should be that same precedent in the therapy world because you're, you're forming a relationship with someone and you don't know anything about this person. You don't know what they've been through. You don't know, you know, if their own family is thriving or failing and you're placing your trust and confidence that they will make your life better. So from that perspective, like I get it that my husband doesn't want to just go to some random person who he knows nothing about. And Like in your example, when you went to therapy as a teenager and just didn't engage, it's like you could take the horse to water, but you can't make it drink, Mm -hmm. right? I think that's the saying or cow or whatever it is. I engaged, but it was kind of like a donkey. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And so like taking someone, whether it be your partner or your kids, to talk to someone about something they don't want to talk to and talking to someone who they don't know, they don't trust. It's just not going to work. And so it's it's always better to focus on yourself first mm-hmm. and change what you can and then reassess. Nothing is permanent, right? You don't have to like, it, focusing on yourself is not you taking the blame for everything. It's just taking responsibility for your part in it. And if other people aren't taking responsibility and you start taking responsibility, they can either show up to meet you where you're at or fall behind, right? Right. Yes. But you won't know until you try. Mm-hmm. And if you just stay in this constant cycle of arguing and trying to change the other person and them resisting, you're going to just stay stuck in that cycle forever until someone breaks it. So why not let that someone be you, right? right. You can step out of that cycle. And it's not easy. It's like super hard to break these things because oftentimes their patterns you learned from your own family growing up and things that are coming out now that you never even had a conscious memory of of learning Mm -hmm. but you can always unlearn those things learn to be there for yourself reparent yourself and show up as a better partner and a better parent or step parent right and it's a journey it's a process it's not like gonna happen over one session or you know in one night or in one weekend workshop it's a lifelong journey and a lifelong commitment to show up heal those parts of you that need to be healed and be better every single day right and that sometimes means failing Mm -hmm. but i believe that when you fail when you do maybe i don't know maybe you do like try to teach your husband something you learned in therapy, right? And make him see things your way. But it's in recognizing, oh, I'm doing it again. And and having that recognition that you can then choose how you want to make amends for that situation. Right. And in making amends, you're teaching others, right? That you're taking responsibility for your part. Mm -hmm. And they learn to do the same, especially when your kids are watching you do these things. Like I've had so many situations where I've been triggered by my stepkids. I might have yelled or said something. And the next day, like if it happens at night, the next day I wake up in the morning fresh and say sorry, right? Like, Mm -hmm. hey, guys, I I was kind of mean yesterday and I shouldn't have said that. And I'm sorry. And I'll try to be better next time. It just really frustrates me when blah, blah, blah happens. And Mm -hmm. then over time, you'd be surprised that they start 
doing the same thing. They they say it back like, oh, I'm sorry too. I shouldn't have done blah, blah, blah. Right. It's one of those things where you exhibit the behavior that you want others to have towards you. Mm -hmm. And I too have woken up the next morning after fussing at Jackson for something and been like, Lori, you were off the chain yesterday. And I will go in there and say, look, I apologize for being snippy with you yesterday. It had nothing to do with you. I was stressed out because of A, B, and C. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry. And I will try to do better. Yeah. And our kids need to hear that because they need to know that we're not perfect. Mm -hmm. And they need to learn to apologize, too, like you said. Yeah, exactly. Now, I think when you go to a therapist, say you pick one to try. I don't see anything wrong with part of your first session being asking them those questions. Yeah. Do you have blended family experience? Do you feel blended families are just like nuclear families? If they say yes to that, run. <laughs> there are similarities, yeah. but they're not not close. You can't compare the mm -hmm. two. Mm -hmm. And we actually had a therapist that was in the academy and I asked her, I said, what do you do? She said, I'm, I'm a marriage therapist. So I was talking to her, and I said, so are you in a blended relationship? She said, no, I'm divorced. And I started laughing. I didn't mean to laugh, but I laughed because I'm thinking, how many people want to go to a marriage therapist that's divorced? Mm -hmm. But that really says nothing about her. It could have been that he cheated on her. Mm-hmm. So we have to, and we don't want to pry into their life and go, well, why did y'all split up? Mm -hmm. But we don't want to discount people because of what's happened in their life. But it is also important that they do understand where we are. It's kind of like mm -hmm. if you went to a physical trainer, you want them to be able to adjust to people that are overweight versus someone that's skinny mm -hmm. because they're going to have different goals. Yeah. Yeah. And oftentimes there are so many different tools you can experience in therapy, so many different tools. Mm -hmm. And I've been lately really resonating with certain tools and trying to find therapists who have gone through that specific type of training and use those specific type of tools like IFS, like Gabor Mate's Compassionate Inquiry. And I know that those types of people will understand trauma and you know intergenerational trauma and, and historical patterns in a way that aligns with my beliefs mm -hmm. and in turn those types of people will be able to help me right it doesn't always matter if they're divorced or if they're together right like sometimes divorce is what's best for for some people right mm -hmm. like some people are just not meant to be together and when you really learn to reconnect to yourself, you can really assess that. Like, is this the relationship that I want or not in my life? So I don't know, like some therapists, if, if they're divorced, like, I don't think that's, that should preclude them from being able to help people because not everyone needs to stay together. I right. Think. That's, that's my viewpoint. I completely agree. But I do know people that'll say, I'm not going to her. She couldn't keep her own marriage together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, yeah. That's why when she said that, I kind of giggled because I was like, <laughs> I wonder how many people are like, oh, I'm not coming back to you. You're going through a divorce yourself. Yeah. But it's like Ron Deal. Ron Deal is well known in the step family, blended family world, but he's never been a part of one. Yeah. He has worked with them for years. Do I think that he should not work with step families and blended families because he's not in one? No, not at all. But I also do believe that some things, until you live it, you don't truly understand it. Mm -hmm. It's true. And I think for me, coming from a background of addictions, and I lost my sister to a drug overdose, like the the type of people that come to me are often experiencing some kind of intergenerational trauma or addiction in their family of origin. And they're really just looking for hope that it's possible, right? Mm -hmm. That some, that you can have 
a positive family experience, whether that be in a blended family or a nuclear family, when you come from imperfect upbringings and maybe trauma, whether that be a big trauma or just little trauma. I know I used to discount how traumatic my upbringing was and compare to other people and think, oh, it's not that bad. It's not that bad. And it's it's not about what happens to you. It's about how you interpret what happens to you. So the same two people could go through the same experience, but one person could go through it and experience trauma and the other person won't. And so it's important to to find people who have been through what you've been through, have processed what you want to process and find examples of people who are thriving despite those past circumstances or despite the fact that, you know, the marriage statistics on second families and and second marriages Mm -hmm. are not great. There are people who are doing it right. And it's, it's good to learn from those people too. Yes. And I know sometimes when you go to a therapist, you have to listen. Mm -hmm. And active listening is hard. I suggest Mm -hmm. if you do go to a therapist, and Anna, I don't know if you do this, but do you take notes? When I'm in therapy? Yes. I used to. I used to be a big note taker, but I don't as much anymore. I I only take notes on like homework or things that I want to follow up on afterwards. Mm -hmm. I'm a big note taker. But Mm -hmm. I also found sometimes taking notes distracted me from listening. Mm -hmm. So sometimes a therapist will give you meeting notes. Mm -hmm. And that's really important because it helps you remember what you talked about Mm -hmm. and the action steps that you need to take without you having to worry about taking notes. Yeah. Yeah. I know in my coaching sessions, I write a lot of notes and I usually provide a little summary or like homework and things like that. Because that part is so important, the integration of it after the session. Yes. But but yeah, I I totally feel what you're saying about being distracted. I think that's why I stopped taking notes. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this. I want your opinion on this. We have worked with a lot of counselors and therapists. Some of them, Mm -hmm. if you go as a couple, they will only see you as a couple. They won't see you individually. Some of them want to meet with you, want to meet with your partner, and then want to meet with you together. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that? And then I'll share mine. I don't know. I've never really thought of that because I've never been in a situation where... Yeah, your husband never went. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) The only time we did go to therapy as a family was not for our... Like, it wasn't for our step family issues. It was me suggesting that my kids, my stepkids go to see a psychologist for a few sessions before we left Peru because it was going to be a big change for them. They weren't going to be with their mom. So my husband was on board for that because it was for the kids Mm -hmm. and it was like the kids were going to go, but he didn't know, I guess that we were going to do an intake session. And when we went to visit with her, she started asking a lot of questions about us and our childhoods and how we grew up and about bio mom and how she grew up. (laughs) And he's like, no, 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 no. I'm not talking to you lady. (laughs) I was surprised at how open he was. And it almost convinced him like he was like, oh, this is interesting. Maybe I'll go for something. And then he never did. But (laughs) (laughs) but it was it was the only time we ever went. And I thought it was good to for her to like see the different perspectives because each person sees reality in their own way with their own filter. So if one person goes to therapy and says like my husband's an asshole, sorry, am I allowed to swear here? Um, (laughs) You know, like my my husband, it's all his fault. He doesn't do this. He does that. He does that. He does that. And it's like. Sometimes if you're in a bad mood and you, you're something just happened to take you off, you know, you're going to be really negative and down on him, but that's not the whole experience. And if you talk to the husband, like his experience will be completely different. Or even if you talk to the same person, like a few hours later, maybe it won't be as bad. Right. Yes. But they, you do provide a really like biased and tainted perspective when it's just one person. And that's why it's always important to, like if if multiple people go, I think it's easier for the therapist to see like what's really going on. Mm-hmm. Whereas if it's just one person, 
you just you really have to question your own perspectives and your own judgments and is that really true is that always the case you know so I think both ways works yeah I don't know what do you think well I think that it's hard for someone to go separately Mm -hmm. and the reason being is because if David went to the therapist I would want to know which I'll talk about (laughs) if I'm always there I can't ask that question it's almost like if you only can go as a couple, it eliminates some of that questioning of what did they tell them behind my back I didn't know about? Or mm-hmm. what are they saying negative about me? Oh, I bet he told her about that time that I flipped out. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I think by only doing it as a couple, if possible, that... Or like one-on-one, I guess. Right. With different therapists. Yes, yes. Mm-hmm then it eliminates that, I wonder what they said, that insecurity. Yeah. And I guess it does taint like the types of questions the therapist would ask because she knows a different perspective. So she might try to get that out. She or he, I'm assuming it's a woman because all my therapists have always been women. But yeah, I've never had to experience that though. So it's an interesting question to look at. Yeah, we had actually... It was when I was interviewing therapists, too, and some of the therapists that we've talked to or people that have been to the therapist, they're like, well, she'll only see us together, and there's stuff I want to tell her privately. Mm -hmm. Well, you can send her an email, but there's a reason they don't separate you. Yeah. And if you send her an email, she's probably going to bring it up, say, yeah, Lori emailed me, David, and she said that you're (laughs) a douchebag on Tuesdays. (laughs) It's it's interesting. A friend of mine went to a counselor or a therapist, and they were trying to tell her how to deal with her concerns when her child was with the other bio parent. And there had been times mm-hmm. that this child's safety had been taken into question, but not enough mm-hmm. to go to court over it, right? So she's talking to this therapist, and the therapist said, oh, well, just don't think about it. Go drink a glass of wine. And she said, if I was an alcoholic, that was horrible advice. Yeah. And she said that she asked the therapist, she said, do you have kids? And she said, yes. She said, well, how would you feel and how would you handle it if your ex-husband had your kid and was putting them in danger? And the therapist was like, we're not talking about me. And she said that just made her mad because she's thinking, no, you need to practice what you preach. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But I think it's important to remember, like, we're all just human and you have to take everything anyone ever says to you with a grain of salt. Like nobody has the answer, you know, Mm -hmm. we have answers for ourselves. And I, I believe that when you connect with your own inner expert, with your own inner wisdom, you can find that answer for yourself. And anything that anyone tells you or anything that comes from the outside, you have to put it through that filter, right? And if it doesn't work for you, like, doesn't work, right? right. There's no one size fits all. And so anything that even like you or I say, if someone doesn't resonate with it, then it's not for them. Right. And that's okay. Everyone has their own experience and their own path that they're on. Mm-hmm. That's like in the beginning, if someone would have told David and I, about Nacho Kids or said, Lori, you just need to leave the parenting to David and be, quote, quote, like a fun aunt to the kids. I'd been like, that's crazy. Mm -hmm. But then when all that happened to us and Mr. Butler kept saying, Lori, they're not your kids. And it hit me in that parking lot that day. I was like, wait a minute. I can, I'm creating my own misery. Mm -hmm. And we know that nachoing is not for everybody. Not everybody needs to. Some people do have the unicorn and rainbows life and they can come in and the stepkids are great and there's a great relationship. And then there's other people that nachoing may not suit you now, but when the stepkids become teenagers, you're going to go, what was that nacho crap I heard about? I might need to try that. (laughs) Yeah. And we know that it's not for everybody. And just like trying to force the nuclear family on 
our blended family did not work. Mm -hmm. And I personally think that's the worst thing you can do. Some of the things that are incorporated in the Nacho Kids method and the process are complete opposite of what you read in books to do. Yeah. And that's what worked for us. Yeah. Because there is no one size fits all, right? Yep. And yeah, I think you're the one who said this, that it made me realize like notching doesn't have to be a permanent solution. It could be temporary. You can disengage, you can re-engage. Mm-hmm. And I think it's important like when you're disengaging not to do it with resentment and like, you know, when you're fed up and like, Oh, I'm leaving. I'm out of here. And like you, you kind of run away. And that's, that's, I don't think that that is what not chewing is. Right. But I think that's what people perceive it as Mm -hmm. that you're just escaping from the problem and like washing your hands of it in a cold kind of way. But I think it's, it's not that at all. It's about disengaging with love because you recognize that what you're doing by trying to meddle, by trying to fix things is not working for anyone and it's causing more harm than good. So it's better for you from a loving perspective to let certain things go and not meddle with them. Yes. Yes. Than to, you know, like keep trying to change everything while you're miserable, while everyone's miserable and that's no good. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, And you're so right that a lot of people do, do it out of anger or pettiness. And, and that's not, it's not going to work because you're doing it for the wrong reasons. And Nacho was created out of love. It was created out of love for David. And if it's not done in a healthy way, it can cause major problems because you're doing it wrong. Yeah. What would be your advice to someone who is like, doing it from that way? How can they show up differently? Well, a lot of it is they're going to have to admit that they're part of the problem. Yeah. Once you admit you're part of the problem, a lot of that pettiness goes away. And a lot of that, oh, well, I'm going to do this to show him. It's it's hard, Anna, because, you know, some people are just downright mean. Mm-hmm. And... They may feel like, oh, I'm not showing. I'm I'm just, you know, ignoring the stepkid and my husband's going to see that his kids are brats and he's going to feel the pain, which they do need to feel the pain. Don't get me wrong. But again, it's your attitude. Yeah. And you need to do some self-reflection and self-healing to where that's not your motivation in this. Yeah. And I mean, sometimes if that's where you're starting from, then it's better to disengage. If you have to do it like not out of love to begin, if you have to do it with coldness and walls up, it's where you're starting from, but it doesn't have to be where you end. Exactly. That self-reflective work that I think can pull you out of that and make you realize that you're not, you don't have to be a victim in the situation. You can choose to show up from a more empowered adult place instead of showing up from that place where you feel like life is happening to you and you have no control and poor you. Yes. Yes. And when you realize you are part of the problem, you can go down either one of those paths. You can go down the, okay, I'm part of the problem. I can fix me or I can work on me. Not that you're broken or anything's wrong with you, but it's just not working for your situation. Or you can go down the woe is me. Life sucks. I'm a bad person. I always cause all the problems. No, don't go there. The blend is hard. And you have to figure out what your role is. Your partner has to figure out their role. The kids have to figure out their role. And one thing in the Nacho Kids Boot Camp is to help you with that. But then there's the Change Your Stinking Thinking Challenge that helps you with changing your perspective on things. Mm Mm-hmm. Because you need to do both. And a lot of people believe that not showing is just disengaging. It is part of the process. It is a big part of the process. But if you stop there, you're not helping a whole lot. You're not improving a whole lot. You're Mm -hmm. just putting a Band-Aid on it, we'll say. Yeah. You've got to do the self-work. You've got to identify your triggers. You've got to figure out how to deal with those triggers or how to avoid them 
you've got to do the self-reflection on, okay, what am I contributing to this? And not only why am I contributing to this or what am I contributing to this, but why? So for instance, with me, I was really tough, I guess you'd say, on the stepkids because that's how I was raised. Yeah. And so I expected them to do the things I had to do as a kid and to have the same responsibilities. Well, I also realized during that time that my mom really, and I talk about my mom a lot, but my mom was the disciplinarian. My dad was probably, I would say, not really involved in our upbringing, but my mom was hard. She wasn't very loving. And by me seeing that, that that's how I was with the stepkids, I'm like, wait a minute. Not that I wasn't loving towards them, but I was just, you need to do this, you need to do that kind of thing. But I realized that I didn't want that for my son. I didn't want him to be raised like I was. Yes, I want him to have responsibilities, and I wanted the stepkids to have responsibilities, but I also wanted them to have the balance of love in there. Yeah. And it's when you have those realizations that you can do something to change it and show up differently, right? Right. That's like, I have guilty parent syndrome. I admit it freely. But it's not just because Jackson's dad and I aren't together. A lot of it's because of how I was raised. I don't want him to be raised the same way. Yeah. My mom was overly strict. I remember (laughs) I was eight years old and I would have to iron my dad's lab jackets. And, you know, (laughs) you know, now, Anna, they would consider that abuse, right? (laughs) But (laughs) yeah, I mean, you know, how dare you make that child iron? (laughs) But I mean, there were a lot of things that I gained from that. But again, there wasn't that balance. It was you feared the wrath of your mom coming home and your chores not being done properly. Yeah. No, in my situation, it was kind of the opposite. Like my parents were so lenient to the other extreme, like that either extreme is not good, right? It's not good to be too controlling and too strict, but it's also not good to be too lenient and just let whatever goes. Kids need some sense of structure and authority. Mm -hmm. And I really try to balance that and not go like, because oftentimes you can swing the complete opposite direction. Right. Yes. If you were raised too lenient, then you become too strict. Or if you were raised too strict, you become so lenient. And and it's the middle ground that's really what's good for kids. They need structure, but they also need to feel safe to be able to explore and and make mistakes. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the hardest things as a parent that I've encountered is letting my son make his own mistakes. Uh-huh. And recently there was a situation that I could have bailed him out. And I told him, I said, I'm not bailing you out of this one because you need to learn. He said, I never expected you to bail me out. I said, I know that, but I'm just telling you. Mm-hmm. Because in the past, I would have. I would have jumped in, bailed him out because I felt bad and sad for what happened. Yeah. And then I was like, I've got to, I've got to let him feel the pain. Yeah. And it's hard. It is so hard. It almost be like your kid getting arrested and you're (laughs) trying to figure out if you should go get him out of jail or not. (laughs) Yeah. Not saying that's what happened with my kid, but. (laughs) (laughs) It's so important though, to take yourself out of the equation, right? Like it's not about you alleviating your own need to make him feel better because that's really for you. It's not even for him. It's, mm-hmm. it's so you don't have to feel that discomfort of what it feels like when you know your children are suffering. Like you suffer when your children suffer. Yes. Right? I think but, we, but, I think we create our own suffering thinking they are suffering. Yeah. And it's important to take yourself out of that and, and really think about what's best for them and their growth. Mm-hmm. And sometimes that does mean failing and learning to get back up again on their own. Yep. And, you know, you said, it's not about you. How many times do we tell step parents that? Yeah. It's not about you. It's not always about you. And a lot of times we make it about us when it doesn't need to be. Mm Yeah. There's so many things that get triggered, though, aren't there? Like, you you get triggered into that childlike competitive state. 
when yes. you're in a step family and it's normal and it's important to give yourself grace and forgiveness and understand that you are okay you're not evil you're not reacting this way because you're a bad person and mm-hmm. and give yourself some space in a safe place not like in front of your stepkids or not against your stepkids to let that out and let that be so that it can move through you and doesn't get stuck within you right right and it's so important to learn to respond instead of react. Yes. And yeah. it's not easy. It's not easy because you've got those little emotions going, but I'm mad. I'm mad. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can be mad, but that doesn't mean you've got to say everything you're thinking. Yeah. Go be and mad. I don't know if you do this in your coaching, but I always um, do visioning exercises where you envision the type of woman you want to be as your empowered self, as your most high self and not high in like a drug sense of the word, but <laughs> you know, like your higher self, I should say. But um, it's that version of you that you strive to become in these situations and not like reacting from these childlike versions of you. Although when you do react from those childlike versions of you, it's so important not to beat yourself up and it's so important to have compassion and be with yourself through those painful moments and move through them. Right. But the visioning and having some goal that you are striving to become is so important, isn't it? It is. It very much is. Now, I'm not very good at envisioning things. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of things will say, oh, well, just you can go in and you can just see how it should be. Like, for instance, furniture. If I go into an empty room, I can't picture the couch here, the a painting here. I can't do it. Yeah. That's just not how I work. A lot of people do, and that's great. Yeah. But we have to remember that not everybody learns like we do, and not everybody. I've tried. I have tried yeah. to do it. And I just laugh because, I mean, it's not like I can't go, okay, Lori, let's picture a picture on that wall. I mean, I can do that, but it is does not come naturally. Yeah. Maybe uh, I need to take a class from you, Anna. On how to I'd do love that. To, I'll send you some of my meditations and see what you think. Maybe, okay. Maybe yeah, there'll be that. a shift. Or maybe not. I mean, it's not for everyone, right? But mm-hmm. the, the important thing is like to create examples in your life. And it may be things that have already happened where you've already felt empowered in a certain place in your mm-hmm. life. And you remember those moments and the feelings and connect to the feelings in your body in those moments. Right. Like, for example, when I have people like, Oftentimes, when I ask people like when they felt really empowered and in charge of their life, it's often like right after a divorce when they move into their own apartment, that feeling, right? Mm -hmm. Or like straight out of college when you move into your own place or, you know, something like that. It's different for everyone or like traveling across the world on your own and feeling really with yourself. Yeah. I can relate to when I bought my first house and I was pregnant with Jackson and how I felt I didn't need anybody in the world. I could take care of me and my kid. Yeah. And the same as when I flew from England by myself back on the plane, I'm like, oh, girl, look at you. Mm-hmm. Because, and a lot yeah. of people will go, oh my gosh, that's nothing. Well, to some people it is. Just like we were talking earlier about your problems versus my problems, no matter how big or little, I can look at your problems and say, Oh, gosh, my problems are nothing compared to Anna's. But that Mm -hmm. doesn't discount that mine are problems. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, feeling that empowered feeling of I've got this is a great feeling. Yeah. And it's sometimes it's so funny because when you I often do this exercise with my clients where they'll describe to me like a situation that was triggering for them and where they reacted badly with their stepkids. and then. Immediately after, I asked them to think of their empowered moment and really connect to the feelings in their body and how they were breathing, how they were standing, the beliefs they had. And then from that place, take them back into the past situation where they were triggered. And I'm like, what would you do differently? And it's like instant. The shift is instant. Mm -hmm. That like, oh, this wouldn't even bother me. I would just keep on walking or I would just make a remark and let it go. Like, but it's it's because when you're being triggered by something, you're pulled into past reactions. 
Right. And it takes practice to be able to show up this way. It takes a lot of practice yes. and it's not a perfect process. And like most times you do fail. I still fail often. <laughs> not going to lie. But you recognize it. And that's the exactly. difference. Exactly. And you recognize and you repair, right? You mm-hmm. apologize. You do what you need to do to make amends. And then you show up differently and you practice showing up the way that you want to show up, whether right. that be through like visioning meditations in your mind or actually showing up differently, all of those things have value because you're practicing a new way of being, right? Mm -hmm. You learn to be a certain way for the first like 30, 40, whatever years of your life. And now you're choosing to step into something different. And that's going to take time, practice, commitment. And it's the little shifts over time that make the biggest difference. Right. And that's like, Again, we have the boot camp challenge and the change your stink of thinking. And the reason those are month long challenges is because it's trying to get you to break old habits and create new ones. Mm-hmm. Because you've you've got to give yourself time to do that, and it's practice. You know, yep. I can tell my son, "I'm sorry I yelled at you because my mom was a yeller," and "I'm sorry I yelled at you. I was having a rough day." But if I turn around and yell at him 15 minutes later, he's thinking, "Well, she's just doing the same thing again." Yeah. And if you do it again, you can go there and go, darn it, Jackson, I'm sorry. I realized I did it again. Mm -hmm. But then the next time you start feeling angry and you feel like you're going to yell at your kid and it's something you don't want to do, step outside. Take a break. Mm -hmm. Set your timer on your phone for five minutes. Play some stupid game. Something to just distract you to where you're not just sitting there angry and festering. I know there's Mm -hmm. a lady, oh gosh, I'm going to mess up her name. I know it. Pumped Up Parenting is her thing. I want to say Celia Kibler. We'll we'll see if that's right. Anyway, Mm -hmm. she teaches parents not to yell. And one Mm -hmm. of the things that she'll ask you is, were you yelled at as a kid? Well, most of the time, yes. That's where Mm -hmm. we get it from. Yeah. And she says, how did that make you feel? What made you feel like crap? And then she says, how do you think it makes your kid feel? Well, like crap. Do you want your kid to feel like crap? Well, no. But now you're making me feel bad that I feel bad that I made my kid feel like crap. (laughs) (laughs) But it's about learning what we can do to improve ourselves. And every one of us should always try to work and improve ourselves in some way, shape, or another. And if you've got friends that bring you down or stress you out, it's okay to let them go. Yep. Yep. And it's so important to look at how far you've come and celebrate that rather than looking at how far you have left to go and feeling like it's too much. Right. right. Oh, there's so much we could talk about. <laughs> I know. I have this friend that we've been friends since high school or actually middle school. Yeah. And I love her dearly. And we went through a lot together through our years, but she is very, very high strong. So when she would call me and she's driving, she's cussing out everybody driving. She's honking the horn. Oh, my gosh. I would get off the phone with her and I was drained. Yeah. And so I finally said, don't call me when you're in the car. I I just, I can't handle it. I don't want to deal with it. I don't want to hear you cussing at everybody and blowing the horn because it stresses me (laughs) out. I that with my mom. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I hope she doesn't listen to this. Yeah, that wasn't your mom, Anna. You, that's a bad memory. <laughs> oh, that's something else we can talk about, too, is how memories aren't always real. But that's a whole nother podcast. <laughs> next time, next time. Yes, next time. Well, we could talk forever because we always have so much that we can talk about. Yeah. But I'm actually talking to Claudette in a little bit. Oh. Yeah. Lovely. I just talked to her a few weeks ago. So I'll have to put your episodes back to back. Oh, nice. Yeah. I don't even know what we're talking about with her. So we'll see. I'm sure it'll be good, though. (laughs) I'm sure it'll be good as well. It's always good. It's always good. Well, Anna, thank you for being a guest. And tell people how they can find you. Thank you, Lori, for having me. I'm um, active on Instagram at Anna De Acosta, D-E-A-C-O-S-T-A. And my website, AnnaDeAcosta.com where you can sign up for my email list and get access to free resources and regular bi-weekly emails from me. I usually send an update based on what we talk about in my group program. So I have a 
support group that meets um, twice a month. And I send some insights to my email list. So even if you're not part of the group, you get you get some insights and, and sharing. So you feel like you're not alone in this journey. And that's completely free. Awesome. So you send two emails a week? No, that's two a month. Two a month. A okay. I think yeah, you said bi weekly. No. Yeah. Yeah. Every two weeks. Yeah. yeah. Twice a month. Yes. It's and really twice a month. I think bi weekly and twice a month ends up being a little different, but it's twice a month. Yeah. Because I was going to say, girl, you're doing better than I am with those emails. <laughs> oh my gosh. No, I'm, I'm behind. I'm often behind, but that is my goal. Uh, yeah. You know, mom of five. That's what I was going to say. We forgot to talk about time. your blend. It's a lot. Yeah. Well, people can find more about that on yeah. the website, but, but I've been, how long has it been? I've been married. It's going to be eight years next week. Goodness. Happy anniversary. Thank you. And I've been with my partner for 10, 10. Yeah. We're on our 11th year. So. And you've got how many kids, stepkids, bio kids? Five kids all together. They live with us full time. So we have the youngest is three. And then we have a six-year-old and an eight-year-old together. And then the older two are my stepkids. They live with us full time, as I said. And they are now 13 and 15. Awesome. Yeah. We all go check out Anna's website. (laughs) Yes. All right. Well, we will have you back on soon. Thanks, Lori. It's always a pleasure. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. Bye. Bye. So, David, you weren't part of this interview. Surprise. You're rarely part of any of them anymore. But anyway, that's a whole other story. I would have done story. it for Anna, but you didn't tell me. Uh, I'd have done it for Anna. That's right. But I mentioned the movie Fireproof. hmm Do you remember us going to watch that movie? hmm We weren't married yet, I don't believe. Nope. I remember we went to Taco Bell afterwards. <laughs> I know. I took you to that high-priced Mexican restaurant. Yep. Yeah, it is a Christian-based movie and has a lot of insight into struggles with couples. Mm -hmm. Anyway, if you haven't seen the movie Fireproof, it is a very good movie. We enjoyed it, and that was a long time ago that we saw it. Yep, I should have called it Blended Proof. (laughs) Yeah, no, if they do one about blended families, it's going to be called Hurricane, Tornado, Tsunami, something proof. (laughs) <laughs> all right david mm-hmm. what else you got going on oh just doing the same old same old trying to put up with you trying to keep you grounded to reality oh i'm sorry were you talking to me <laughs> <laughs> i interviewed a lady the other day about active listening okay D- did you like listen to her i i tried <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty bad when you can't, you can't actively listen to somebody that's trying to teach you how to do active listening. It was very interesting because you and I both, and probably 99.9% of our listeners, are not very good listeners. Huh? Our listeners aren't good listeners. Did you hear that? Yeah. Yeah. I'm actively listening. Well, see, and we'll talk more about this when we have her as a guest, but if you just, if I'm actively listening to you, when you stop talking, then what? I'm supposed to remember what you said and comment on it? <laughs> well, you're not actively listening if you're commenting. Right. So that would just be a one-sided conversation. No, you just have to switch back and forth. When it's your time to talk, then you talk. Okay, so you talk and talk, and you're one of these people that talk and talk and talk and talk. Who, and me? Talk and talk. I'm just saying. Oh. Uh, and 20 minutes later, you say... Do you know what I mean? I say, and I uh-huh. and I say, uh, uh huh. Well, you shouldn't be going twenty minutes later. I think if you let somebody talk to you for that long, that's not active listening. That's just abuse. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So anyway, that's one of the things we got in the works for y'all. All right, I'd be interested to hear this one. We also have a return guest coming back in a few weeks. So they they blended twice? No, they've been on the podcast before. Oh, is it like a follow up? Yeah. We should find out like the like the top I don't know. I would say 10. Let's say 3. 
like the top three podcast guests and get them back on the show? Well, David, how would we do that? By downloads? Yeah, by the most listens. Because we can ask people all day long, what's your favorite episode? And they ain't listening. <laughs> <laughs> Linda, Linda. Linda, li- listen, 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 Linda. <laughs> that kid's probably 20 years old now. <laughs> yeah. How many did you say? Top how many? I'll just say three. Oh, okay. Let's follow up on them and see, what, see how they're doing. I can think of a few I like to follow up on. <laughs> well, I do want to say that a lady reached out to me the other day about the interview we did with Laura Beth Ferguson. Oh, yeah, I remember that one. You can still give me a hard time about that one. Yeah. I was scared when she mentioned the interview. <laughs> but she said that she had looked up some of the information that Laura had provided, and she couldn't find anything. I think Laura's stepped out of the step family stuff. Oh, but really? She wanted to make sure Laura was okay. Okay. So that was sweet. Yep. So Laura Beth Ferguson is doing well. She remarried and she don't want to talk about this stuff no more. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, David, we can look into that. Which are the ones that you would like to have back? Um, I want to talk to the Oscar Mayer Wiener girl. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I talked to her or chatted with her. Yeah, I know you mentioned something about that. Okay. So I'd like to talk to her again. Um, let's see, who else? Oh, no, Ariana. Yeah. yeah. But I think they're kind of dealing with parental alienation, so there's probably not a big update. Yeah. There, there's Honestly, there's quite a few. I'm trying to think of the, you know, the top three. Some of them I can't think of their names as much as I can think of, like, the topic that we talked about. But... Yeah, I have to go back and kind of look at them, but yeah, it'd just be interesting to catch up with some of these some of these folks. Matter of fact, I think there's probably been a few that we said that like we need to circle back with them. Well, I make notes when I interview people, and I say, well, as I say this, tell you what I'm doing. I'm like, I probably will never see that again now that I think about it. But I do take notes and say, have them back to talk about such and such in a couple of years. Mm-hmm. But then I don't look at these books after I get that podcast released. So I need to find another way to do that, run back through them. Because we do want to know the progress people have made. Mm -hmm. Even if you've left your blend, that's okay. Yep. Where are they now? That's the episode. Where are they now? We We do a series. That's what I was going to say. Where are they now? Series. We could do a whole year of where are they now? (laughs) (laughs) Because, <laughs> you know, in the blended world, it's all like, are they still married? <laughs> are they still together? Yeah. Oh, what about did, the- did they have an hours baby? I think I'm going to go in our Facebook group and on our Facebook page and ask people. Yeah, let them vote, too. That's fine. And we'll see if we get more than two votes. <laughs> if we do, then we got three episodes. <laughs> there you go. Yes. Yeah. Probably need to have a follow-up with your son, Branson. You know, yeah. the one I don't have anything in common with. <laughs> yeah. Now, see, what I, wanna, what I wanna do is follow up with Branson, like once he's married or maybe even have as a kid. <laughs> so well, he, Ethan's had a kid. Oh, yeah. We can get And Ethan Avery's back had on. a kid. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But that's, that's whenever they'd start figuring out that, oh, wait a minute, this relationship thing's hard. This mm-hmm. this uh, raising the kid thing's hard. How did yep. how did Daddy do it? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Which I've already had. I think Ethan was the one that came to me and was like, "Dad, I don't know how he did it." <laughs> he he did because he said it in front of me. Oh, so you'll admit that that was what happened, David? <laughs> I'm surprised you. Too bad your memory is not as good about other things. <laughs> I know. So I'm thinking about you. I'm going to not show you, and yes, I can. <laughs> All right, anyway. the end. That's it, folks. Thanks for listening. Thanks for putting up with Lori. Now you know my struggle. We'll catch you again next week. Remember, life is good. Oh, we're supposed to remember something now? Oh, see, you forgot that too? But what about people that can't remember? And you're asking them to remember that life is good. No, they don't have to remember. They just have to be here at the end of every episode. (laughs) Help. (laughs) Send help (laughs) to. You don't have to remember. Just know life is good. When you nacho. Remember that. Remember that. (laughs) Remember that. Remember that. I want to do some subliminal stuff. Nacho. 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 (laughs) Thanks for 
for listening to this episode of the Nacho Kids podcast. Find us online at nachokids.com. Until next time, remember, life is good when you nacho.